This is John Massingale. On Friday, March 14th, Victor Dover and I made a short presentation at the Regional Plan Association to a small group of people from the RPA, the New York City DOT, Transportation Alternatives, and other key people thinking about the Vision Zero campaign. Mayor de Blasio and DOT Commissioner Trottenberg have made the Vision Zero pledge to reduce traffic fatalities to zero in New York City within 10 years. Here is the presentation. Victor and I decided to write this book because there were so many exciting things going on in street design. We've both been involved in street design for decades. We first worked together 20 years ago, and we both witnessed how the pace of change has dramatically picked up the last several years. Of course, some of the most exciting things are happening right here in New York City. Jeanette Saadi Khan would be a hero in our book, and in fact we call her a hero in our book, if she had done nothing more than send a crew out overnight to change Broadway at Madison Square into this. DOTs have enormous control over our streets, and Jeanette was one of the first DOT commissioners in the country to say, I'm going to use the control for the good of the pedestrian instead of the car. Now we're in an equally exciting time. Mayor de Blasio's and Commissioner Trottenberg's Vision Zero pledge to lower traffic deaths to zero changes everything. Because Vision Zero tells us there are only two ways to move to zero traffic deaths. Either separate the people from the cars or slow the cars down. Nothing else will get you to zero. That means, as Commissioner Trottenberg has said, that we are going to have to change our behavior, including the way we drive in the city and the way we design our city streets. That means a political discussion, and of course, those can be difficult. It also means our city streets can get better and more walkable, and that is what most New Yorkers want. To understand where we might go, it's interesting to look back 100 years. I want to emphasize that I don't think we want to go back to the way things were then, but it's interesting to see what life was like before what some now call organized modernism changed our cities and our city streets. Organized motordom is a name we use to describe the coalition of car companies, oil companies, and other groups like the brand new American Automobile Association. All these groups and companies wanted to increase automobile sales and automobile use, and they realized that wouldn't happen unless they could change the way cars operated in cities, so that cars could go quickly and easily from point, B to, from point A to point B. This photo shows Broadway in 1908 looking north from the elevated subway at Herald Square towards Times Square. You can see that most of the people are over on the sidewalk, but that they are very comfortable stepping out into the street. Out in the middle of the street are the cable cars that ran up and down Broadway, powered by cables in the basement of the cable building at the corner of Houston and Broadway. People wait in the middle of the street to get on the cable cars as cars, cable cars, and horseless carriages flow all around them. Notice that there are no stoplights, stop signs, traffic signs, or striping anywhere in the road, and most of the pedestrians do stay over in the sidewalk. Just one year later, organized motordom sort of like the all-powerful bike lobby, only powerful, managed to get the sidewalks in midtown Manhattan on 5th Avenue cut down from 60 feet to 45 feet, making the new roadway 10 feet wider than the sidewalks when it had previously been 10, 20 feet narrower. And we are off to the races. The space between the sidewalks became transportation corridors, where the job of the engineer was to make the traffic flow as smoothly and quickly as water in a pipe. Over time, a lot of those pipes became what we call auto sewers, particularly new roads built in the suburbs without sidewalks. But a lot of the same philosophies were brought into city streets, even Manhattan streets, where 80% of us don't own cars. Manhattan and the outer boroughs got many suburban-style arterials, designed to get suburbanites quickly and easily in and out of the city. Many of these are also the roads where the most fatalities take place, because on city streets you can't make the separation of cars and people that Vision Zero advocates. Suburban and exurban streets can be made without those impediments to smooth traffic flow. 
Traffic engineers call trees fixed hazardous objects, FHOs, and they're taught to whenever possible restrict them to the vegetative containment zone, away from the edge of the arterial. Pedestrians are MHOs, moving hazardous objects, and best practice also recommends moving them as far as possible from the edge of the road. Oops, that's not Lexington Avenue. But some of the design prin principles of this complete street in Florida have crept into city street design. Free and uninterrupted traffic flow is not the only one. In the early 1990s, the Federal Highway Administration mandated and funded the creation of state and local jobs around the country for pedestrian and bicycle specialists. These specialists mainly worked in suburban situations, on roads that were too wide, too ugly, and too spread out for anyone to want to walk or cycle on them. Nevertheless, their job was to try to tame these roads, as well as other suburban roads that had been widened by the organized motordom movement. Later, a lot of these techniques were brought into the city. This is East 4th Street in Long Beach, California. Long Beach is sometimes called the Brooklyn of Los Angeles. It's a real city with a real downtown and a wonderful climate for biking and walking. Long Beach has put a lot of work into new bike lanes, but you can see that work has not gone into making walkable streets. This is a suburban style arterial in the center of Long Beach. It is a transportation corridor now with a bicycle lane added in a way that is a compromise between the desire to move cars and the desire to keep cyclists alive. It's a bike lane about throughput and it's not a bike lane that's safe for children. Here's another place on the same street. You can see that it is a place to park cars but not a place where people want to get out of their cars and walk. The sidewalk is an afterthought and is narrow and crowded with things like hydrants. Most of all, the place that Jan Gale calls the space between the buildings, the place where public life takes place, has been cut up for the convenience of the car, and it is an ugly place scaled to the needs of speeding cars that clearly says only a small meager place on each side of the road is for humans. Here's the real Brooklyn. This is a place where people want to be. It is human scaled, it is beautiful, and it does not visually segregate the center of the public realm for automobile use only. So what are some street designs that incorporate bikes into more harmonious and hospitable places? In Paris, they took half of this very busy artery on the left bank and gave it to buses, taxis, and bicycles. You wouldn't want your 11 year old to ride here, but it's a great place for the man or the woman in Lycra. It also keeps the space between the buildings as a public space. Here's another busy street at a time when it wasn't very busy. This simple concrete strip keeps the riders safe from the traffic without the heavy-handed, over-engineered infrastructure of Long Beach. Here's a Parisian cycle lane that's safe for children. It's also a harmonious part of a very beautiful street where people want to be. And here's a bike lane in Berlin that combines the sidewalk and the lane and separates both from the street by trees. These German networks are also safe for children. Low traffic, slow speed narrow streets can be safe and comfortable sharrows. When I ride around Greenwich Village, the sharrow going north on West 4th Street is more comfortable than the bike lane going south on the parallel Bleecker Street. Why? Because some drivers think the bike lane shows the rider should be way over on the side and they can be very aggressive and drive close to you to let you know that. Of course bike lanes in New York like this one on Pike Allen are some of the exciting things going on in the city today. And we have a long history here and there like this bike lane designed by Olmsted on the Ocean Parkway in Brooklyn. Vision Zero and the Vision Cone go together. Speed is why Vision Zero changes everything. Slowing cars to 20 miles per hour does three important things. First, the driver sees much more, more than twice as much at 15 miles per hour as at 25 miles per hour. Second, the driver has more time to react and slow down and swerve. Third, cars that are going more slowly don't kill the pedestrian when they hit them. We all understand why 
drivers want to go faster, we all do, but speed kills. Faster cars kill people. So we want to get to the roundtable discussion. We're almost done. Just a few quick points. No one thinks we should go back to the New York City streets of 100 years ago, and Victor and I don't think we should immediately emulate a place like this beautiful street in Amsterdam. Where just as in old New York, they have almost no stop signs or stoplights. But Amsterdamers decided back in the 1960s that they didn't like what even those small, funny Dutch cars are doing to the quality of life in Amsterdam. And they set off on a course that has led them to a wonderful urban life in which cars, bicycles, and pedestrians all share the, the city streets. At intersections, they look each other in the eye and negotiate who will cross first. Of course, that means cars must, must go slowly. So during the round table, we would like to discuss what we might do here in New York on the important streets coming up for review, like five, Fifth Avenue and Lafayette Street, which is half a block from my office. Earlier this week, Community Board 2 gave preliminary approval to a heavy-duty transportation corridor solution. There are more walkable solutions. Working just half a block from Lafayette, I'm confident in saying that local residents and workers would be interested in seeing them. And it's worth repeating that although the engineering solution reduces fatalities, it will never get the city to zero deaths. That requires slowing the cars down, and once that happens, you don't need the heavy-duty engineering. And once that happens, you can have human-scaled streets where public life takes place in the space between the buildings. The overwhelming majority of New York residents and New York visitors walk around the city. And in the end, urban design and placemaking make streets that are both safer and more inviting for pedestrians. Fifth Avenue and Lafayette Street offer the perfect opportunity for imaginative solutions that build on the New York City DOT's innovations in the last few years and go even further without design baggage from, from streets designed for faster suburban conditions. Manhattan already has too many one-way arterials designed for suburbanites to drive in and out of the city. We need streets for the rest of us. Okay, so so. I This is Victor Dover. As a way of testing out the conclusions we were reaching while researching and writing the book, John and I took a handful of special conditions in Manhattan and illustrated what if. We asked, how could the revolutionary changes that have been unfolding on New York streets ultimately play out on these places? This is a special segment of Bleecker between 10th and Christopher. And here, seen from above, North is up. Now down on the ground, looking south. From the knees up, this is one of the nicest street spaces around. The slight diagonal, where the grids come together, results in a triangular wedge of space that's very agreeable, and this adds variety to the grid. But the space is a little wasted on the car. From the ankles down, it's obvious the restriping has been successful recently in taking back some of the right-of-way previously devoted solely to motoring. This was big progress. But it's still auto space in which pedestrians and bikes are tolerated. Feels like an unfinished project. But what might it look like in an even more evolved form? What if the area striped off here was consolidated, as it was at Madison Square, and we took the next step to shape it into a really composed urban scene. Now we're looking south. In this variation, one of several, the space is now a plaza and the whole street segment is raised. The traffic in the narrow through lane would have to come through the plaza but on the pedestrian's terms. So what's now striped space and the asphalt today is captured and then it becomes tomorrow really useful pedestrian space, and the cafe tables can spill out into that space on the attached side. There are places for a monument and a fountain at the end of the vistas. In our book, we catalog historic streets. The point is that a richer menu of street design options is needed, and this catalog is meant to encourage good experimentation. 
A section of the book is devoted to the Rambla or Promenade Street type, which have wide pedestrian promenades down the center of streets. Those are the streets that are the principal organizing features of cities like Barcelona, where they are also the principal social spaces for the flanking neighborhoods. And then, in our chapter on retrofitted streets, we make proposals for applying the lessons in those historical examples right here. Second Avenue is a route for cars moving down the island, but for people who live in that neighborhood, this is their neighborhood avenue. What if? Today, the avenue is largely dug up to install the new subway line, which will bring new people to the avenue. What if? What if, just for a segment or two, some wise future Vision Zero civilization made a choice to use less of that street for speedy through movement and took back the center for its own promenade for walking and dining? Through movement here could be maintained, but it would be reduced. Now this is a view of existing conditions looking south. Before and after. Here's a cross-section through that what-if scenario we called the Yorkville Promenade. As the Vision Zero campaign quickens in the outer boroughs, new challenges, big challenges, will await. For example, taming the boulevards. It's going to require a lot of this before and after what-if thinking. Visualization. The public process will require helping people visualize change before it occurs. As you know, it always requires thinking about change over time as the private real estate investments catch up with the street redesigns. We use before and after pictures in this sort of work partly because they are easy to understand and partly because when you leave the after image on the screen for a while, and then change it back to before, it creates a sense of urgency to do something about what's out there today. Now this example is from Northern Virginia, showing a strip corridor restored as a proper multi-lane, multi-way boulevard. When multi-way boulevards are done correctly, the pedestrian realm along the sidewalks next to the storefronts is extended into a slow-moving side access lane separated from the through-going lanes by tree lines. Obviously, the last few years in New York City have been a great restart, but now Vision Zero changes everything.